Queenscliff is a popular seaside holiday town based on the Bellarine Peninsula in the state of Victoria, Australia. Prior to European settlement, it was inhabited by the Bengalat Bulag clan of the Wadharong tribe, members of the Kulin nation. Originally a fishing village, Queenscliff soon became an important cargo port, servicing steamships trading in Port Phillip Bay. A shipping pilot service was established in 1841 to lead boats through the treacherous rip and its two lighthouses, the high and low lights. They were constructed in 1862 to 1863. Queenscliff also played an important military role. Fort Queenscliff was built between 1879 and 1888 and operated as the command centre for a network of forts around the port. Fort Queenscliff, built between 1879 and 1889, is located some 106 kilometres from Melbourne on the western side of the entrance to Port Phillip Bay. It occupies an area of 6.7 hectares on high ground known as Shortlands Bluff and overlooks the shipping lines leading to Melbourne and Geelong. The fort is a superb example of the defences that existed around the coastline of Australia from colonial times through to the end of the Second World War. By 1941, World War II had already been raging far away in Europe and North Africa for three years. Australians were able to go about their day-to-day -day business without the threat of imminent war. This all changed though in December of 1941 with the outbreak of the Pacific War. After a surprise attack by Japanese forces on Pearl Harbor, as the Japanese forces crept through Asia and closer to Australian shores, Australia were now under threat. On the 15th of February 1942, Singapore fell, and four days later, the unthinkable happened. Darwin, in Australia's Northern Territory, was bombed for the first time. This was the largest single attack ever mounted by a foreign power on Australian soil. With a country now facing its greatest test, the whole area of Geelong and Bellarine Peninsula were placed under on high alert. Much of the Bellarine and her coastline was under military control. But no one could predict the two murders of 1942, which are still to this day officially unsolved. The first murder, Private Roy Willis. Arthur Roy Willis was born in Stowell, Victoria in 1898 and known to those who knew him as Roy. Roy was described as 5 foot 4 inches tall, of medium build, grey eyes with a fair complexion and hair. His character was noted as decent, honourable, hardworking and reliable. In 1916, Roy was working as a labourer when he first enlisted into the 1st Australian Imperial Force just aged 18. Roy served in various units until 1919 when he was demobbed and back on Civvy Street. During the period between wars, Roy worked on a farm as well as a school bus driver and delivery driver for the Hamilton Butter Factory until the outbreak of World War II threatened Australia once again. So keen to do his bit, Roy was worried that he was too old to enlist and he lied about his age. He was just 44 and single. After refresher training with C Company, 15th Training Battalion on the 28th of Feb 1942, he was sent two weeks later to the 3rd Garrison Battalion at Queenscliff, working for the transport platoon. Roy had just three weeks left to live. The Geelong to Queenscliff Road, now the Bellarine Highway, runs about 30 kilometres and links Geelong all the way to Queenscliff. Just off the highway is the Wallington to Ocean Grove Road and just two kilometres south of the highway is a minor cross intersection in a small hamlet called Wallington. This intersection with Rhines Road and Lake Road, now Lings Road, was in 1942 a dirt track running off to the west towards Lake Connewara. 
it was here that Connie Cook was awoken by a single gunshot at around 2.45am in the early hours of Friday morning on the 29th of May. Her first thought was that someone was spotlighting or performing military manoeuvres. Mrs Cook heard the first shot followed by another a few seconds later. After five minutes had passed, she heard five more. Arthur Roy Willis was dead. Friday the 29th of May was a typical late autumn day with a temperature of 15 degrees. As daylight commenced around 7.30am, a local man, John Perrett, walked past the intersection of Wallington Road and the Old Lake Road on his way to work around 7.50am. As he passed, he saw a soldier lying on his back on the grass verge. He thought it was a little odd, but didn't stop and carried on his way. 45 minutes later, around 8.35am, James Carlin was riding his horse along the Wellington Ocean Grove Road when the horse became skittish. When he looked over, he saw the same soldier as Parrot lying on the ground. The soldier had an overcoat or greatcoat alongside him. Carlin's first reaction was that he was asleep, but it soon became clear that there was something wrong. Without stopping, he rode over to a property to use the only phone in the area at that time, where the police were immediately sent for. The body when examined was clothed in military uniform with a cap and that an overcoat was near the right arm. There appeared to be bullet wounds in the face, neck and head. The victim was quickly identified as 44-year-old Private Roy Willis. As police were gathering evidence for trial, four months later, on Tuesday the 1st of September, another soldier was murdered. The second murder, Gunner John Holston. As well as the main Fort Queenscliff defences, a secondary fort known as Crow's Nest, approximately a kilometre west of the main fort, was built. Crow's Nest Camp was built to provide accommodation for the troops manning the fort. Whilst the main fort was built to block access through the heads, Crow's Nest was to protect the Lonsdale Bight between Queenscliff and Point Lonsdale. Access to Crow's Nest Camp, where two 4.7 inch guns were located, were heavily restricted. Guards were always on duty at the entrances to the camp and battery. There was a farm gate which led down to the beach, which had a restricted access by the public. Late on Monday, 31st of August 1942, 17-year-old Gunner John Holston, originally from Dimboola, was told to report for duty as a last-minute replacement at the 4.7-inch gun battery. The gun battery was located in the sand dunes in the front of the officer's accommodation, Mato, at the corner of Stephen Street and the Esplanade, in Queenscliff. The duty was to be from 3.30am to 5.15am. The small sentry box was located on a public roadway at the end of Stephen Street, which was adjacent to, the, adjacent to the Crow's Nest Army Camp. On the night in question, the skies were clear but cold and the temperature was at a low of 6 degrees. There was a full moon with bright patches of moonlight and a high wind blowing. At approximately 4.20am, Gunnar Waterson, a fellow soldier, was on his way to the wash house when he was stopped and challenged by Holston. Waterson returned around 25 minutes later, but by this time, Holston was nowhere to be seen. Lance Bombardier Max Boughton was in charge and told Gunners Harry Jones and Abraham, Abraham Parkinson to search for the missing sentry. Whilst they were gone, Broughton went into the camp thinking he may have slipped off to use a toilet, but instead of Holston, he encountered someone running through the camp kitchen. A strange time to hear someone Broughton went to investigate, but found no one. The mysterious figure has been now named the Running Man. Upon his return, all hell had broken loose, as Parkinson and James looked past the gate to the beach, following drag marks down. They noticed a crouching figure at the bottom and so call, called out, What are you doing down there, Johnny? 
but instead of a reply, the person fired at both soldiers. One bullet hit James in the thigh and another bullet hit the butt of Parkinson's rifle as he was trying to reload the ammunition. After assisting his mate, James raised the alarm and, searched, and a search for Holston and the running man was deployed. Nearly two hours after Holston went missing, the army handed it over to the police. All that was found was Holston's rifle and a torn pair of army issue trousers on the beach. For 10 days, there was no sign of Holston. On the morning of the 10th of September, a local fisherman, Steve Ferry, found Holston's body wedged in a rock pool some 400 metres east of where the rifle had been found 10 days later. It appears that Gunnar Holston was shot at close round in the chest at the sentry box. His balaclava and helmet were found in the sentry box, which has led investigators to believe that this was a case of mistaken identity. The killer, or killers, may have shot Holston, believing him to be the guard who was meant to be on duty that night. The original guard was also due to give evidence in the Willis murder, believed to know the name of the killer slash killers. Sadly, it is believed that the police knew who the killers were, but had insufficient evidence to make a conviction. It is believed that the two murders are connected through the black market. Being a driver in the transport platoon gave soldiers greater freedoms than others to leave camp. With the civilian population of Geelong and the Ballerine in the grip of widespread rationing, black market goods were on the rise, despite there being hefty fines of a thousand pounds. Although there is no evidence to suggest that transport platoon were involved in the black market, Roy Willis would have been aware of this and may have even been approached. One theory is that Roy had been approached to engage in black market activity but declined, and the people who asked him could not be quite sure that Roy would give the game away, and so he had to be silent. As for Holston, it was just a sad case of mistaken identity. Had his face been exposed that night, the incident may not have happened, and there would only be one murder. More details of the cases and the military cover up can be found in Bob Marmion's book, Murder at the Fort, where if you read between the lines, you may even guess who one of the two killers were. Strange happenings in Wellington. Intersection of now Lings Road in Wellington is said that the house still stands where Roy Willis drew his last breath. Although there have been no sightings told, the owners that now reside there often report things going missing from their shed and have joked that it is Roy that has taken them. Again, whilst using the app that um, spirits can allegedly use to talk through, um, I was driving along the Esplanade just away from Crow's Nest Camp at the end of Stephen Street and the words popped up Roy and rest in peace. Now at the time I had it recording while I was in the car and um, I didn't actually know about Roy Willis then um, so that's interesting. Uh, I later went home and looked it up and just put in Roy Queenscliff and then up came the murders and I was like, oh wow, Roy, rest in peace. That's pretty um, coincidental maybe or was it actually someone from the camp in 942 saying rest in peace? Maybe it was John Holston saying rest in peace because he would have been alive, obviously, for the four months after his death. Hmm, very interesting. Sightings of Gunner John Holston This extract was taken from Murder at the Fort by Bob Marmion. It was Christmas of 1959 and eight-year-old Greg and his younger sister Marilyn were staying at their grandparents' house in Stephen Street, Queenscliff. The summer was hot and the children wandered down Stephen Street, past Crow's Nest Army Camp, which was now a children's camp, to the beach. 
As they walked down the path towards the beach, young Greg suddenly heard a noise, as if someone was running through the scrub. The tea tree had grown back up since 1945 and was now pretty dense and high. As the children turned to see what made the noise, a figure suddenly came running towards them from the direction of the beach. It was a young man in a soldier's uniform. He was very young, not very tall, and appeared to be slight of build. What was strange, though, was the fact that he was wearing a brown-coloured army-type coat and that he had shorts or underpants on. Greg's first thought was that he was missing his trousers. He ran past the children and curved through the scrub about four to five metres away and just looked at them. And then just as suddenly as appeared, the soldier vanished. Over the years, other people have reported seeing the same deathly pale apparition at different times. One witness claimed that the figure had shouted, help me, help me, as he ran past. Was this the ghost of Gunner John Holston? Another sighting has been reported in Fort Queenscliff's underground magazine shelter by a guest on a tour. Upon reaching the museum, the lady asked the tour guide quietly, is this place haunted? The tour guide asked her what she saw. The lady replied, a young soldier of medium height with short dark hair. The tour guide showed the lady a photograph of a soldier and asked, was this the person she saw? The lady replied, yes, that's him. She had just identified Gunner John Holston. His ghost is said to roam the fort's underground magazine shelters, haunting today's soldiers with the sentry's traditional demand, who goes there? On my recent tour of the fort, I too went down into the magazine shelter and using an app in which allegedly can help spirits communicate, I had the response, you shouldn't be here. Was this Holston still on duty? I also recently went to the site of where the sentry box was at the end of Stephen Street and used the app again. And very faintly, and I will play it for you, I swear I can hear him say, John, listen for yourself. State your rank and number, please. Did you hear it? The next story about the sighting of Gunnar Holston comes from an online source, Reddit. The ex-duty officer, officer had told the tour guide this story. Apparently there are instructions to the duty officer or duty PK on encountering Gunnar Holston. It says, The Australian Army does not believe in ghosts. However, it is Army policy and tradition that once posted as a PK, no soldier may stand down from that PK until he is formally relieved of duty or hands over that duty. During your guard circuit, if, at night, Within the confines of the fort, or the tunnels and magazines under the fort, you encounter a bloodstained soldier dressed in khaki battle dress. This is not a ghost. Gunnar Holston is still on duty. You are to take the following procedure. If you are posted as a PK, say, pass friend, all is well. If you are the duty officer, say, Gunnar Holston, I relieve you of your duty. PK is a soldier or small unit of soldiers placed on a defensive line forward of a friendly position to provide timely warning and screening against an enemy advance. So, that's the story of the two murders in 1942 in Queenscliff, Victoria, Australia. I hope you enjoyed them and please do check out Bob Marmion, Marmion's book, Murder at the Fort. It has a lot more information that I didn't really want to say in this cast because I'd like you to read the book. There's a lot more information in there. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe and hit the share button. It really means a lot. This is my new venture and I really hope it goes well. Thanks for listening. Take care. Be spooky. Bye.